All right, uh, so there's a lot to talk about today in joins, which is a very important topic. Uh, extremely low turnout today. Uh, I can only assume because it's, what, 85 degrees in, in October, which is crazy. I don't remember there being this, this, this hot. Have you? Uh, no. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and my parents don't believe in global warming, which is crazy. Um, they think it's because the planets are aligning a certain way. It's, it's all a big hoax, which is really All right. All right, so um, we're going to talk about joins. Again, joins are super important. Uh, it's probably the... Uh, this is where we're going to spend a lot, most of our time in an analytical database processing queries. So we, it's very important for us to get, get it right. So the first question is, why do we even need to join? Right? So it's, it's sort of a byproduct of having being a relational database system and normalizing our tables because we're splitting them up to reduce the amount of uh, repetition or redundant information. So we want to break them up into different tables. Like, again, foreign keys are, are a natural way of doing this. All right, uh, you know, you have Andy's orders, sorry, you have the table of all the orders, and every single order can have multiple order items, so you have a separate table for the order items. So now if you want to run a query and say, give me all the uh, order items for Andy's order, then you want to join those two tables together and get all the, get all the, uh, the related data together. So the way we're going to do this is, again, through a join operator. Right, the join operator is going to allow us to reconstruct the original tuples without any information loss. We, we want to do, do this as efficiently as possible. Because, because again, for, for analytical queries, the tables are going to be quite large. So you know, this could take you know, minutes, hours, even days, depending on what algorithm we, we choose. So the, for this lecture, we're going to focus on joining just two tables at a time. And we're going to only focus on doing inner equi joins. So two tables is probably the two table joins is probably the most common join that algorithm that's implemented in database systems today, right? This is what pretty much every single every single major uh, open source system and commercial system does because it's sort of the natural way to think about how to break up a query into join operations. Um, there are algorithms that do uh, multi-way jo joins or m-way joins, like take three or more tables and join them exactly at the same time. That mostly exists in the theoretical world, although there are some high-end systems that do support this. We can cover that in the advanced class, but for our purpose here today, we're just, we just want to understand the basics of joining two tables together. And they're also going to focus on NO echo join. So an echo join means that we're taking a tuple from one table and we're just, we want to check to see whether there's an equality match in, for another tuple in the other table. Right? We're not worried about less than, greater than, we're not worried about anti-joins, like not equals to. So the algorithms we'll talk about today can be tweaked to support those other types of joins. It's not a major change, but for our purpose, we're going to focus on the equi join because that's the most common one. We're also focusing on inner joins because that, again, in addition to that being the most common one, to do outer join support for the algorithms we're talking about today is, is not, a, not a major major operation, a major change. So in general, going forward, for all the algorithms we're going to talk about today, the, the thing in the back of our mind that's, that, that we should understand of how we're going to organize the join operation is that we're going to always, almost always want to put the smaller table as the, as the left table in the join operation. Right? So think of like the query plan tree. Uh, you, you, know, you have the left side and the right side of the child's inputting into the operator. So we'll say the left child is the one that we want to be the smaller one. When we talk about nested loop joins, I'll also refer to this as, as the outer table. Right? So even though some algorithms don't have nested loops and therefore they don't have an outer table, we'll always say outer table to mean the, the left side. All right, so before we get to now discussing what the algorithms are, we have, there's some other de design decisions we have to make in our database system to talk about how all these join operators are going to work. So again, the way to uh, understand what a query plan is, think of this, we're taking the relation algebra of the SQL query and we're converting it into a directed graph or a tree structure. And so at the, at, the, at the leaf nodes, we have our access, we're accessing the tables and they're feeding tuples up as input into our, our child operators, or sorry, our parent operators. So this is what I was saying here. So this would be the join operator. So this would be the left side, and then this would be the right side. So this, this would be the outer table, and this would be the inner table. So the two design stages we have to figure out are what is the output of our join operator? Like what is the actual low-level bits we're sending up into our, our parent? And then how are we going to decide whether one algorithm, one join algorithm, join algorithm implementation is better than another? So for the first one, it's going to depend on what our database system, how, how it's actually implemented, and, and other factors of its environment. 
So in general, what we're trying to do is we're trying to say for every tuple, uh, lowercase r in the relation big uppercase r, and any tuple that matches in, in the, the other table s, we want to then produce some output because that's, you know, they, they satisfy the join predicate and we're sending that up to the next operator in the tree. And so at a high level, when we understood this through relational algebra, when we, when we first just talked about joins, we just said it was a concatenation of the two tables, of the tuples of the two tables. So you take all the attributes in R and take all the attributes in S and you mash them together and then that's the output going up. But that may not always be what you want to do in a real system. Theoretically, that's okay. But in a real system, we have to worry about disk read. We have to worry, worry about uh, you know, our, how much memory we're using. So we can be a bit more uh, careful about what we're sending along. So what we're actually going to use as the output of this operator and sending it up to this next operator can depend on our implementation of our query processing model. Again, that we'll cover on Monday next week, but just know that you know, it's not always the case where I'm sending one tuple at a time. I could be sending multiple tuples at a time. Could be also depend on my storage model, whether I'm a row-based system or a column-based system. And then it also depends on what the query is. Depending on what's above me in my query plan, in my tree, I may not want to send all the attributes for the both tables. I want to maybe send a subset of them. So the first approach we could do is actually just send data. All right, so we're going to copy the values of the attributes for the, the tuples that match our join predicate. And then we're going to produce a new output tuple that we shove up to the next guy. Right? So say our table looks like this, R and S. And when we do a join of them, again, we're just concatenating the attributes of R and, and appending then the attributes of S to them. And then that's the, new, that's the result of this join operator. So in our query plan tree, the output of this operator would be this entire thing. Right? So the benefit of this approach is that up above in the tree, we never have to go back and ask for more data from our underlying tables. Because everything we, we, you know, that came out of RNS is produced in our joint output. So that's fantastic because, again, we're not going back and reading more stuff uh, after the fact. But it's bad because now we're, we're essentially materializing this in giant tuple. In my example here, I only have five attributes, so you know, maybe not that big of a deal. But if I have 1,000 attributes in R and 1,000 attributes in S, and now I just have this 2,000 attribute tuple, that gets to be pretty wide. And now uh, I'm copying that as, as my output going up above. And that can get expensive. So the, again, the benefit of this is that you never have to go back and get more data. Um, you can be a bit smarter and recognize that, in this case here for this particular query, I, for the, for in the case of table R, I only need the R ID for the rest of the query plan. So maybe instead of actually sending up uh, the R, you know, RID plus, plus the, the, the name field, maybe I just send up RID. So I could do a projection down here to start stripping out things that I, don't, that I know I'm not going to need up above. And then likewise, when I'm, as, as part of the output of this join operator, I can embed or inline a projection operator and recognize that, well, after I do the join on SID, I don't need value and I don't need SID. The only thing I need is the creation date, the C date field. So as my output, I can do a projection and strip out that so that only, you know, then essentially I don't have to do the proje projection above because it's already done for me as I produce the output of the, of the tuple in the join. All right, the other approach is what we talked about before when we talked about column stores, is that we only now pass along the bare minimum information we need for the, uh, for the join keys. And then we also include the record ID of where the, where we, how to go find the, the rest of the data in our table. So say we do our join like this, all right, we're only joining on RID and SID. So the output result of the, of the join operator will be just the RID and SID that match. And then the record ID or the tuple ID, which is you know, the page number and the offset or where we can go find the rest of the data in, in, our, in our database. And then we just pass that up into our tree. And then up here, when we say, oh, we also need this creation date, because we have this field here, we know how to go back to S and get the rest of the data that you need. All right? So again, this is ideal for column stores because it's very expensive for me to go stitch together the tuple from all the different columns and put it back into a sort of row-based form as I shove it up into the, the query plan. So if I can delay as much as possible having to do that materialization, putting all the tuple back together into its original form, then I'm not passing along much, much of data up above. And furthermore, say that I'm feeding up maybe a billion tuples from RNS, but only one or two tuples match after the join, 
Then up above, when I go fetch that, the, the creation date, the C date field, it's, you know, I'm only going and grabbing maybe two pages. So again, this, this, is called, this technique is called late materialization. This is what this is, was in vogue in about 12, 15 years ago when the first column store database systems came out, things like Vertica. Uh, and it, it sort of it seems like this would be a huge win. Uh, Vertica told me that two or three years ago, they actually got rid of this optimization because it turns out it doesn't actually help you. Because the cost of going getting this data out is so expensive to do in the beginning, you might as well get everything you need from the get-go and not worry about going back getting it later. Because this could be on like, you know, the, the data you're getting could become on another machine, and now you're going over the network to go get that data, not just like reading local disk. So the, again, the first column store systems that came out in the 2000s all promoted this technique. I don't know how many actually still use it today. I know Vertica does not, which was very surprising when they told me this. All right, so again, so this, is, this is how we're going to decide what we're going to shove up into the operator tree, and depends on what our environment looks like, what, depends on what the query wants to do. The other thing we have to now consider is how we're going to determine whether one uh, joint algorithm is better than another. And so the way we're going to do this is by basing on the cost metric of how many IOs we're going to have to do to compute the join. So for the rest of this lecture, we're going to use this nomenclature here. So we'll say that we have on table R, it's going to have M pages with a total of little m tuples throughout the entire table. And table S will have n pages with, uh, with a total of lowercase n for tuples in, in, uh, in S. So we're going to use these, these variables to determine what the I.O. cost is for the various algorithms that we'll look at today. And so the important thing to point out is that we're only considering the, the cost of actually to compute the join and not the cost to actually produce the final output result. Because that's going to be constant throughout all the different algorithms. Right? If I do a sort merge join versus a, a nested loop join on tables R and S, right, they're, it's, they're always going to produce the exact same result, and therefore that cost is the same across both of them. And furthermore, for the stuff we're talking about today, we don't know the number of tuples they're going to output, because we know nothing about what the data actually looks like. When we talk about query optimization or query planning, we do have to start making those estimations, because now we need to start considering where to move the joins in the query plan. But for now, we're just focusing on take one join operator, what's the best algorithm for that? And we're going to base that entirely on the number of IOs to compute the cost. OK? All right, so real quickly, the last thing to talk about is the joins versus cross product. Again, we're focusing on inner echo joins today because that's the most common thing. We're not even really going to bother talking about cross products or, or cross joins or Cartesian products because these are almost super rare, and you never actually really need, need, you know, need to worry about them. Right? And there's nothing really you can do to make these run, the cross products run faster because it's just two for loops just iterating one after, after the other and everything matches. So it's like a nested loop join without a predicate to ch check on matches. The other thing also say too is that there will be a bunch of techniques we can apply to our join algorithms as we go along today that can make things run faster. Uh, but in general, there's not going to be this one optimization we can always do that will work for every, every single possible scenario, every single possible data set, every single possible query. So certainly, again, I'm going to teach you guys the basic of these algorithms. I'll see for hash join one optimization we can do, because I think it's a really useful one. But for our purpose here today, we're kind of going to be sort of blind about what the data looks like and not try to do any sort of one-off ad hoc optimizations. OK? All right, so in general, uh, there's three categories or three classes of join algorithms. There's the nested loop join, which is the most basic one. And every single database system that says you know, they're supporting joins, at the, very, at the very least, they're going to support something that looks like a nested loop join. And then we'll talk about doing sort merge join, which will build on the sorting stuff we talked about last class. And then we'll talk about hash join, which is the most important algorithm, because this, this is almost always going to be the fastest one that we're going to want to use. OK? All right. So let's start in the beginning. Nested loop join. It's exactly as it sounds. It's a, nest, it's a for loop nested inside of another for loop, right? So all you're doing is for every single tuple in the outer table, R, and you're going to iterate for every single tuple in the inner table, and then you just check the predicates in, in your where clause, your join clause, in your SQL query, see whether they match, and if so, then you emit it as the output. Right? It'll, be, it'll be buffered as the output for the next, next tuple above. So again, the parlance for outer versus inner is just as, as it sounds. The outer table is on the outer for loop. The inner table is, is on the inner for loop. And this will be slightly confused when we talk about hash joins, because hash joins don't have nested for loops, but we'll, and we still refer to it this way. 
again, and then, and in terms of how it looks like in the, in the actual query plan, it's it's usually designated as the the right, sorry, the left operator going into the join join query or join operator. The left input is the outer table. The right input is the inner table. All right, so this is like the dumbest thing to do. To do a join, why? Absolutely correct. So he says, for every single tuple in R, we got to go scan S and bring all that back into memory every single time. So we're not doing anything about locality. We don't know anything about pages or blocks at this point. We're literally just saying, for every single tuple in my outer table, let me go fetch the page that has the, the tuple for my inner table. So like it's, it's, like, it's super dumb and super expensive. right? So the cost for this, using our, our variables we had defined before, is big M plus little m times n. So big M is the number of pages in the outer table R. So for, we have to read every page, right? And then the, uh, the, this inner part here is for every single tuple we have in the outer table, we have to go then fetch every single page on the inner table. So this little m times big N. So that, you know, this sort of seems abstract to you guys because it's just a bunch of variables, but let's actually put some numbers into it and see how retarded this is, okay? So let's say our table R has M pages, or sorry, has M a thousand pages with a total of 100,000 tuples. Table S has 500 pages with a total of 40,000 tuples. So we just plug and chug these, these, the, the, the values for these variables. We see that for big M plus a uh, little M times, times big N, we do 50 million IOs. So say we have a speedy SSD that can do uh, an IO in one tenth of a millisecond. So roughly 100,000 to 200,000 uh, nanoseconds per I.O., which is about what a standard SSD can do. Um, you can pay a little bit more money and get, get faster, but in general, that's, that's what a consumer-grade one can do. So now, if you take this, 0 0.1 milliseconds times this, it's 1.3 hours to do that join. All right? So, all right, what's one optimization we can do to try to speed this thing up? I said before in the beginning. Smaller table should be on the, uh, as the outer table. So if we do that and rerun the, rerun the formula, now we're doing 1.1 hours. Not much, you know, not much better, but you know, it is slightly faster. So this is, like, this is like super stupid. This is the worst case scenario. Because assume where we're doing four kilobyte pages, then if you just do the math, this two, the size of these two tables is six megabytes. That can sit in L3 cache. So for something that can fit in my CPU cache, if I had to go get a disk, go get it, I'm doing one, it's taking one hour, right? Like you can do this in memory, you could do this join as two nested for loops in like microseconds or nanoseconds, by microseconds, all right? It should be super fast. But if we have to go to disk and we're not smart about how we're going to disk, then we're gonna pay a huge penalty. So one way to improve the nested loop join, the stupid one, is to be mindful that we have blocks. We have pages. We can pack multiple tuples in our pages. So now if we just say, we'll have one block for uh, the input, uh, sorry, one block for the outer table, one block for the inner table, then for every block we fetch in the outer table, we'll fetch, uh, we'll scan through all the tuples, and for each block in the, for each tuple, we'll go fetch, sorry, for each block on the outer table, we'll fetch one block at a time for the inner table, and we do our join for every tuple in the, inner ta the outer table block for all the tuples in the inner table block. And we don't go to the next block in the inner table until we have completed our, our evaluation for all the tuples in the outer block, all right? So this is a little bit better now. So assuming that, uh, you know, we, again, we have one block for the outer, one block for the inner, now our cost is big M plus big M times N. Right? Before this was little m, because we were doing, for every single tuple in the outer table, we were fetching every single page in the inner table. But now for every single page in the outer table, we're fetching every single page in the inner table. So this is a little bit better. And again, what should be the outer table? The smaller one, but in terms of pages, not tuples. Right? right? It could be that we have one that has, has, has fewer tuples but more pages, uh, then, then the other one, we still always want to base it on, on which one has the, the least number of pages. So going back to our example we showed in the beginning, again, plug and chug these numbers, 
Now we can do our join in 50 seconds. Still bad. This is, like, don't, get, no, don't get the wrong idea. This is still terrible. To, again, to join six megabytes should not take 50 seconds. But you know, we're not one hour. We were before. So again, just by being smart about that we're, no, we're doing sequential access, we're reading uh, you know, a single I.O., we're getting multiple tuples, just making that simple change of our nested loop algorithm, we, we can cut it down to being under a second. So what if we can generalize this? Right? Instead of having one pay or you know one block for the outer, one block for the inner, what if we had multiple blocks? And so the, the way this is going to work is, for the outer relation, we're going to buffer as much as possible in memory uh, in b minus two blocks, and then we'll retain one block for the for the inner relation and one block for the output result, and we can do a little bit better. So, right? And again, the basic algorithm looks like this for b minus two blocks in the inner relation, then I'll go fetch one block for the, the for, for b minus two blocks in the outer relation, I, will, I go fetch one block in the inner relation, do the, so the, the scan across the of them, and then when I'm done the inner block, go back and get the next one. And then when I'm completed all the inner blocks for my table, go and get the next b minus two blocks on the outer table. So now again, plugging, chugging the math, instead of having to do uh, m, m reads, M page reads on the on the uh, on the outer table. It's M divided by B minus two, and you take the ceiling of that, because that's telling me how many chunks of of a B minus two blocks I can I can divide the outer table into, and you take the ceiling because the last you know the last segment of B minus two blocks may not be exactly B minus two, so you always always round up. All right. So now what happens though if the outer relation fits entirely in main memory? meaning the size of the amount of buffers we're, we're, we're allowed to have is greater than m plus 2. Again, the plus 2 is 1 for the, for the inner, 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 inner relation or the inner table and 1 for the, for the output result. So if we can fit b minus 2, all, you know, b minus 2 equals was exactly the size of the, of the inner relation, sorry, the outer relation, then we're golden. Because all we need to do now is just go fetch the outer relation once, bring that into memory, and then just scan through the inner relation once. Uh, so then it's m plus n. So now I'm at the, I'm at 1500 IOs, and now I'm at 150 milliseconds. That's starting to get more realistic, right? So again, this is like the best case scenario, right? If if you can fit the if you have enough memory to fit the outer relation of memory, you know the nested for loops, the nested loop join is probably going to be good, okay for you. Um. But of course, now if your database is like terabytes or petabytes, you can't do that, right? So in general, why does this suck? Why does the nested loop join suck? Well, because we're, it's basically a brute force search. All we're doing is sequential scans on the outer relation and the inner relation. We know nothing about the locality of the data. We know nothing about the data that we're looking at, right? We're just assuming it's just we don't care. We're blindly just looking for, for matches. So, if, as we said before, sequential scans are always the, the fallback option for when we don't have an index, we don't, can do, can't do anything smart. But if we can be smarter, like if we know we have an index, or as we see in a second in the sort merge join, if we know things are sorted, then we can make these sequential scans be a bit, bit smarter. So, the, one of the things the database system can do, it can recognize that if you have an index based on the keys you want to join on, then, for, at least for the inner table, then you can use that as, as part of the inner loop instead of actually having to do the sequential scan every single time. So there's two ways you could do this. So one is, if you already have an index available because the, you know, the application created it for you, then you're golden because you just use that. And again, that's going to be very common in OLTP workloads because, as we said, if you have foreign keys, the, you have to have a, you know, an index to enforce the foreign key uh, constraint, so therefore you would use that to find the thing that you're looking for. Some systems can build uh, an index on the fly. It's essentially what a hash join is going to be, as we'll see later on. But in other systems, like in SQL Server, they can actually build a B plus tree on the fly. They call it a spooling index. Like during the query, then they run, you know, run the query, do the join using your index, and then when the query is done, they just throw it away. Again, the idea here is that the, the, the cost of doing sequential scan is so expensive that it's better off to build an index, you know, an ephemeral index right now to do my query, and then I'll just throw it away. 
So let's see how we do it in next nested loop join. So again, all we're doing is that we still have to do the sequential scan on the outer relation. And again, we can use use additional buffers or blocks to to not have to go fetch you know have I/O for every single tuple. But in the inner part, the inner for loop, we're now going to do a probe on the index. And then if we find a match, we would then go um, check to see whether we have a a uh, you know produce as an output. Now. The index does not be, need to be exactly what we're, our join key is. So if we're trying to say we join on column A and column B, if we have an index on A, we can still do that index probe to go restrict now the number of tuples we need to evaluate just on that attribute A. But then now, once we get the output, we do that additional match to see whether we have whether B matches as well. So the index doesn't need to be an exact match. So now what's the cost of doing this? Well, it depends. It right, depends on what the index looks like. So we're just going to represent the cost of probing the index with some constant c, because again, if it's a hash table, then it's you know best case scenario O1. If it's a B plus tree, then it's log n. Right? But we replaced that that having to go access every single page in the inner relation, that uppercase n, with this constant. And that's in general, that's gonna be much better, much faster. So this is all you really need to know about nested loop join. Like I said, it's the brute force approach. It's the most simplest thing. If any database system says that, you know, a newer system says they, they support joins, it's more likely that, that they're doing this because this is, again, this is the easiest to implement. So the main things we need to be mindful is that, again, always pick the smaller table as the outer relation. We're going to try to put the outer table as much as possible in memory to reduce the amount of redundant I.O. we're doing on that. And then if possible, if we have an index on our inner table, then we want to use that. Otherwise, we fall back to just doing a sequential scan. Okay? All right, so again, this is like the dumb thing. We don't know anything about the, the data. We don't know anything about what the values look like. We just, other than having an index, we're just always doing a brute force search. So let's try to be a bit smarter. And this is what the sort merge join tries to do. So as I said last class, this is super confusing because I'm going to teach you the sort merge join algorithm. But in the sort phase of the sort merge join algorithm, it can use the external merge sort that we talked about last time. But in the external merge sort, it has its own merge phase, which is different than this merge phase. So this is confusing, but the only thing to be mindful of is like the sort phase, we just use the external merge sort we did last class, or quick sort if it fits in memory, and then the merge process will be different than what, what they did before. Again, so two phases, sort it first, spill to memory, or spill to disk if necessary, and then in the merge phase, as we'll see in an example, we're going to walk through the two sort of tables one by one and do comparisons across them and if we and see where we have a match. And in some cases, we, we, never, we only have to look at each tuple once in the inner relation. We, only, we always look at one tuple, to each tuple once in the outer relation, but in, in the inner relation, we may also not have to go backtrack ever and look at the same tuple multiple times, uh, but we don't have to go jump to the very beginning every single time the way you have to do in a sequential scan. And that's the, that's the advantage you get by sorting ahead of time. So this is a uh, approximation of the algorithm. The basic way it's going to work is that after sorting, we're going to have two cursors, one on the inner table, one on the outer table, and they're going to walk uh, step by step down looking at tuples. So at each iteration, uh, if the outer, outer relation cursor is pointing at a tuple that has a value that's greater than the inner one, then we're going to increment the inner cursor. If the outer is less than the inner, then we implement, increment the outer. If we have a match, we produce it as an output, and then we increment the inner. So reading code like this is difficult, so let's, let's do a visual example. So again, we have two tables, and we want to join R and S on, on the, uh, the, uh, the ID column for both these tables. So in the very first step, we're going to do sorting. And again, this is just the external merge sort or the quick sort, depending whether it fits in memory or not. So now our result is sorted. And what we're going to want to do now is, again, have our cursors walk through these two tables. So we're going to start at the very beginning here. Right? We have a cursor on R and a cursor on S. So the first thing they're going to do when they start, they're going to go look at the, the, the value, that the attribute they're joining on, the ID field. In this case here, the, the tuple that the outer relation cursor is pointing to, the value is 100. And for the inner relation cursor, the value is 100. So that's a match. So we would produce that combined tuple as our output for our, for our join. And then now at this point, we then increment the inner relation cursor and move it down by one. So now we look at 100 again. And again, that matches on this. 
and what we're pointing to here, so we produce another output. And then we increment it again, and now it's 200. So now at this point, 200 is greater than 100. So the, we increment the out of relation cursor. So now, so, so in this case here, we know that when we want to do this evaluation between does 200 equals 200, which it does, and we produce our output, we don't need to go back and look at anything else because we know at this point the cursor is looking at 200. And it's the first time I've seen this value 200 on this, on this side of the table. So I know I don't need to look at anything up above in, 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 the, in the table. So if you were just doing a nested loop join, you don't know that. You'd have to do the scan all the way from the beginning. But because we pre-sorted everything, we can say, well, everything above me in 200 doesn't need, doesn't need to be examined to do this join. So that's the advantage that we're doing here. That, that's the benefit we're getting over sort merge over the nested loop join. So let's look at a case where we have to do backtracking. So the, uh, the outer relation is 200, the inner relation is 200. We already produced a match. Now we increment the, the inner relation, and now it's 400. And so now 400 is greater than 200, so we increment this side. But now we have 200. So if we just kept going down and only going down, down one by one, we would have missed the match between this other 200 that we had up here. So we, we had to maintain some metadata on this side to say, oh, I, the last value I just looked at, it, looked at was 200. So as, if I increment this thing and it matches the last one I just saw, then I know I need to go back to the very beginning when I first saw that value on the, on the inner relation, and then I can do my match and, and do my join and get the match. But then everything else just proceeds as before. Now I increment back to 400, and then 400, once again, is greater than 200, so we increment this guy. So again, the main, the main thing I'm stressing here is that we may have to backtrack on the inner relation, but we never backtrack on the outer relation. We're only examining the outer relation once. So 300 is uh, less than 400. They're not equal, so we increment the outer relation. Now 400 equals 400. That's a match. Increment the inner relation. Four, 500 is greater than 400. That doesn't match, and that's, that, since that's greater than this, increment this. Then now we have five, a match on 500, so now we increment this, and now we reach the end. So we can't stop here, because again, we don't know what's coming down below us on the outer relation. We may need to backtrack, because this next tuple might actually be 500, and we'd have to go back up and go back you know, at the starting point where 500 is. Right? But in this case here, for this example, there is no match, so we keep going until eventually the, both cursors reach the end, and then the join is complete. Yes? Um, so like how, how would exactly would you track the last value? Like would you just track like the first occurrence of the previous case? So you can, like if you have like more points in your table? His question is, going back here for this backtrack part, how would I keep track that I, I saw 200 before, now I'm seeing 400, and then when this guy sees 200, I know I need to backtrack? You just say, here's, here's the, for the last value that's different than the current value I'm pointing at, here's the starting location. So if you had a bunch of 200s here, you know you have to jump to the very beginning, right? Yes? If I have, uh, like in my metadata, I'm storing the last value, right? Yes. The previous value, and say I have reached the end of the, uh, this second table. Yes. And in my first table, I get a value that is greater than the last value stored, then I can terminate, right? Then I don't need to go to the end of the first. Yeah, so his, his point, which he's correct, is like, if I'm down here, I finish my last one, and now I'm off, and say, well, the last thing I saw was 500. So over here, if I get to 600, I know that 600 is greater than 500. There can never be anything below me that's going to be matched with this, so I could just terminate here. Yes, you could do that. Okay. So what's the cost of doing this? Well, the sort costs on the inner and the outer table are just the, uh, the, the external merge sort costs that we talked about before, right? assuming we, we have to spill to disk. Um, so now, but now the merge cost roughly is m plus n. Right? At the, at the best case scenario, I'm going to read every page on the outer table once and every page on the inner table once after they're sorted. Now, I just showed in the backtracking case, that's not exactly true, because if I go back here, if say 400, 500 on one page, but then I got to backtrack to 200 and that's on a previous page, I got to go fetch that again. 
But again, we can't compute that for our, you know, in this example because we don't know what the layout is of the data. So we're just going to simplify it and just say that it's 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 m plus n. Again, so the cost of, of the total sort merge sort algorithm is the cost of the sort phase, whichever sort algorithm you want to use, and the cost of this merge phase, which we approximate to be m plus n. So now, if we say we have 100 buffer pages for our for our simple example, then we can sort R and S in two passes. Again, that's just using the formula from from last class. So therefore, the and then the merge cost is just reading each the thousand pages from the inner, sorry, a thousand pages of the outer, the 500 pages of the inner, which is 1500. So you take the cost of sorting R 3000, sorting S 1350, and then the, the merge pass 1500, you get to 5850 IOs which is roughly 0.59 seconds, 500, 590 milliseconds. So again, the, the, the block-based nested loop join, we could get it down to 50 seconds. And now in this case here, we're, now we're under a second. Now this is starting to look reasonable, right? So the worst case scenario for the cert merge, which is, which is rare, but it, it could happen, is that you have every single value on the outer table is exactly the same as every single value on the inner table. So like every, every value in the, tuple, in the tuples is just one, right? So sorting is just wasting time because you're not sorting, you know, you're not getting any benefit from that because it's just going to be the same, you know, columns of ones all over again. And then now you're just paying the, the, the cost of walking through the, you know, it's reverting back to a nested loop join, right? But this is rare, right? This is not like people... People do stupid things in databases, but this one's pretty stupid, right? And the database system can recognize, oh, I have only one, one value for this column. Don't even bother doing the sort merge. Just, you know, it essentially calls, falls back to the Cartesian product, which is just two nested for loops. So in that case, when is the sort merge join actually useful? Well, if the two tables are already sorted on the join key, then we're golden. Because now we don't even have a sort cost, right? This is what that clustered index stuff I talked about before. If I have, if I'm doing a join on attribute ID attribute, and then I have a clustered index on my table where it's sorted on the ID attribute, then I don't have a, a, a sort phase. I'm exactly where you know the data is where I want to be, and now I just have my cursor just go through and, and lockstep with each other. It's also super helpful is when the the if the query contains an order by clause, and the order by clause is the same, you know, what's to sort the table or sort the result on the same keys that you want to do a join on, then I'm getting a two for one. Because now I do my sort, mer sort merge join, and then the output is sorted in the same way that the order by clause wants it to be sorted. So I don't even have to do that order by clause. So again, the database system can recognize that, oh, I, my query looks like this, because again, it's declarative. I, you tell it how you want it to be sorted. And it can look at that and say, oh, well, you want to be sorted on this key, and you want to also join it on this key. So let me do the sort merge join rather than doing a nested loop join or a hash join, and then followed by an order by, because I just cut off that extra operator entirely. And that's going to run way faster. So again, it's all the same things we talked about before in the last class. Uh, if we have an index that's already sorted in the way we want it to be and it's clustered, we can just use that. Otherwise, we, we fall back to the external merge sort. Yes? So when you do a sort like this, is the sorting result usually cached or stored somewhere? It seems wasteful. So his question is, um, again, and we will talk about this uh, on, on, um, on Monday next week. His question is, Where's the output of the of the sorting, right? Is it cached? Well, so it's an intermediate result for the query. Like it, so then it's where it's backed by a buffer pool. So if the buffer pool has to spill, spill a disk because our sort data set is too large, we, we, we already can handle that. But that's why we pick the external merge sort because that try to maximize the amount of sequential IO that we're doing. Because we, we, it could be the case we, we have to spill a disk. Yeah, so it's cached and it's specific to, to the one query that you're, that's running it. And then we can do the... I think we talked about scan sharing a little bit, but like if we recognize that two queries want to sort the same data at the exact same time the same way, we could piggyback and just do it once and share it across the two of them. Right? The high-end systems can do that. My SQL and Postgres cannot. Okay. So sort merge is super, super useful. It's a, the Postgres supports this. Uh, all the major commercial database systems support this. The sort of smaller, newer, embedded database systems don't usually support this. Uh, they usually support nested loop join, and then if, they're, if they get their shit together, they can support hash join. Uh, which, but not everyone can do that. All right, so let's talk about hash join. 
So again, this is gonna be the most important algorithm we're gonna to wanna to use to do joins, because this in general is gonna get the best performance. Uh, for large, large data sets, this is, this is pretty much always what you're gonna to wanna to, want to do. So the basic insight of how a hash join is gonna work is similar to how we were doing that hash-based aggregation at the end of the last class. Right? Our hash function is, is deterministic, meaning for the same input, the hash value will always produce, be the same thing. So that means that if we have values in the outer table that hash to a certain thing, or certain value, and then values in the inner table that hash to the same thing, because they're equal, then we can use that to sort of partition and split things up so that we only have to examine things within the same hash bucket. Again, it's, another, it's like a divide and conquer approach. All right, so that's the basic idea of what we're gonna do. That we're gonna split the, the, the outer relation up into partitions based on or the hash key. And for this one, oh, we'll, we'll get to it in a second. But this one, if it's in, if it'll, if it's gonna be fit, everything fits in memory, we can use a linear hash table, linear probing hash table we talked about before, like a static hash table. If we're gonna have to spill a disk, then we can do that recursive partitioning on a bucket chain hash table that we talked about also before. So again, the idea is that if we have tuples in the same partition, because they hash at the same location, then we only need to worry about guys that are, that are in my same partition. I don't have to look across the entire table. Again, the idea is we're paying an upfront cost to split the data up to make the search or probing process run, run much faster. So a basic hash join algorithm has two phases. In the first phase, the build phase, you take the outer relation, you do a sequential scan on it, and then you're gonna populate a hash table. And then in the second phase, the probe phase, now you do a sequential scan on the inner relation. Using the same hash function, you then probe into the hash table you built in the first phase and look to see whether you have a match. And if you do, you produce, produce it as the output. So at a high level, it looks like this. Right? So again, this is what I was saying. So, so about four about inner versus, inner versus outer tables. So in this one, we don't really have an S to for loop. We have a for loop to build the hash table and a for loop to do, do the probe but we still refer, refer to the, the relation we're gonna build the hash table on as the outer relation for, you know, for just to keep everything consistent. So in the first step, the first phase, we're gonna populate this hash table. We're just doing a sequential scan on this guy and, and insert our, our, you know, the, the, the key that we wanna put into to the hash table. Then in the second phase, we just do a sequential scan on the inner relation, probe inside this. Doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter what hash table implementation we're using, but we know how to always find an exact match. And if we find one, then we produce that as an output, right? Pretty straightforward. So the key again is just whatever you're doing a join on, the value can depend on how you actually want to implement your 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 hash table in, in in your system, right? And as we said before, it can depend on what the output is going to be or what the output what the what information is needed up above in the query plan that'll determine what you actually want to store. So this is this classic trade-off between storage and compute in, in computer science. We could store the full tuple because that's everything we need to produce the output up above, plus that's everything we need to do our join in our hash table. But of course, now that, that makes our hash table much larger, which means we could have to spill a disk more, um, but at least computation, it'd be faster to find exactly what we want because we jump into the hash table and we have everything we need right there. The other approach is sort of do some, something like the late materialization approach where we just store the tuple identifier and when we hash into the, into the, into the hash table, we scan until we find the key that, the, you know, a key that we want, but then we would see that we have this tuple identifier that we, we have to go follow along and get more information that we need. And so again, for, for, for column stores, this approach is usually better in general because the, the hash table is much smaller. This one would be better for row stores because it's, it's, you're, you're storing, you store all the data you need and you never have to go back and go fetch entire pages that have the, all, the entire tuple all over again. Okay? So, one simple optimization we can do, and this is the only sort of, other than spilling to disk, this is the only optimization we'll talk about for joins today, is for the probe side. So, in the build phase, as we build the hash table, we can also build an auxiliary data structure or a filter that can deter help us determine whether the tuple we're looking for is even going to be in the hash table without actually having to look inside of it. So to do this, we're gonna, we can build a bloom filter. Does everyone know what a bloom filter is? Who, who does not know what a bloom filter is? Okay. 
I have backup slides for, just for this very reason. I, can't, I, I don't know what people's background is for this kind of stuff in algorithms. So let me teach you very quickly. All right. A balloon footer is a super, super useful data structure you're going to come across throughout your entire life. It's awesome. So it was built in the 1970s. The guy that invented it is named Bloom, uh, and that's why it's called that, right? So it's a probabilistic data structure that's a bitmap that can, that can answer set membership queries or set membership questions. So a set membership question would be like, does this key exist in my set? And it'll come back and say yes or no. It can't tell you where to go find it. It's not an index. It's a filter. It just tells you yes or no. But the interesting thing about it is that it's a probabilistic data structure or approximate data structure, so it could give you actually false positives. So it'll never give you any false negatives. So if you ask it, does this key exist? It always it says no, then you know that's actually true. But if you ask that key exists, it may come back and say, yes, that key does exist, but it actually may be lying to you. And then you got to go actually check something else to see whether that's true or not, right? So it only has two operations. The basic Bloom filter can only do two things. You can insert a key and you don't look up on key. You can't delete a key. So here's how it works. So it's just a bitmap, right? So say this is a really simple 8-bit Bloom filter. And so when we want to insert a key, like RZA from the Wu-Tang Clan, we're going to hash it multiple times. And then whatever the hash value we get out, we're going to mod it by the number of bits we have. And that's going to give us a location in our bitmap. So in this case here, the first hash mod 8 goes to 6, so that goes to that location, and then mod, mod 8 goes to 4 for this guy, and that goes to that location, and then all we do is just flip that bit to 1. If it's 0, we set it to 1. Now we say we insert Jizza, same thing, he hash it, and we get 3 uh, for the first hash function, and we get 1 for the second one. Same thing, we jump into the hash table, we flip it to 1. This is super fast, we can do this extremely fast because this will all hang out in, in CPU caches. So now we want to do a lookup and look, look for Raekwon, the chef, right? If we hash this, we get five and three, right? It five points to this one, it's zero, but then it points to this one, it's one. So in this case here, because all the keys, all the, sorry, all the, the locations in our bitmap are not one, we know that this is, does, cannot exist. So we would get false and that's correct. And this is why you never get a false negative. But we may look up for ODB, uh, and we hash to three and six, but now this hashes to these two locations that we populated before with the RZA and JZA, but we never actually inserted ODB. So here's where we're getting, we're getting a false positive, right? So this is the, the Bloom footer is coming back and telling us this key exists when it actually doesn't. Okay? Bloom filters are awesome. Uh, again, they're super useful for a lot of things, and they're, they're super, there's like, you know, you can take a billion key data set and put it down to, you know, a couple, couple kilobytes for a Bloom filter. Yes? He says, can you delete a key? No. Right, because what would happen, right? So, like, say, going back to, sorry. Right, in this case here, uh, right, RZA went to 6 and 4, so we flipped those bits. And then JZA went to 3 and 1. Uh, this is a bad example, but like we could have another key that would hash to maybe to one and two, and now we want to delete it. We don't know whether that one is from our, you know, where we're, whether we're the only one. You could turn this instead of it to a bitmap, you could turn it to a counter, then you, you can do that, but now that's getting larger. We want something to be something really fast for us. So that's what a Bloom filter is. Yes? So this question is how big do you initialize the Bloom filter to be, depending on the size of the, the data set? Um, kilobytes, if that. Like, they don't need to be very big. And there's this, and then you can actually also vary the number of hash functions you use, and I'll, that'll determine the number of the, the, the your false positive rate. Uh, the larger the, the balloon floats, the more hash functions you use, the, the better the false positive rate. You can get it down to being, you know, I think like 10 per key or something like that. It's like super small. These are going to be used for you know all other parts of the data systems. We'll come up, we can talk about later on, but like for our purpose here, we're we're using them for joins. Again, and, and the difference between this and a index is that this is just telling you whether something exists. It doesn't tell you where it exists. Where an index will tell you it exists, and here's here's where to go find it. I'm glad I included this slides because I wasn't sure who who has seen Bloom filters before. Okay, so the optimization we're going to do with our Bloom filters is 
as we're building our hash table, which is going to be large and could spill to disk, we'll also build a bloom filter for all our keys, which is, which is going to be super small and can fit in memory. And so, again, as we populate the hash table, we build the bloom filter. And then now when we do our probe, we pass the bloom filter over to this guy. And before we probe the hash table, we go probe the bloom filter. That's in memory. That's super fast. If our key doesn't match anything in the hash table, then the bloom filter will say you don't have a match. And we stop right there. And we avoid having to do that hash table lookup, which could be disk IOs to go jump to find the things we want. Otherwise, if it comes back and says true, then we have to go check the, the, the hash table because this might have producing might might have been telling us something incorrect, like a false positive. Yes. So, so her question is for the bloom filter, how many hash functions you use? It depends on how you configure it. Okay. My example, you showed two. Other ones, you, you could have more. Depends on how large you make it to as well. But in general, I. I Actually, I don't, I don't. Yeah, I, I, actually, there's open source packages for bloom filters. I don't know what the default is. It's probably like four. Yeah. Yeah. His question is, if the filter, his question is, could it be the case that the bloom filter has every bit set, and therefore everything values to true? Yes. Yeah, so that's why you have to size it. You know, it'd be a certain amount. So, like, again, we'll talk about query planning in in two weeks, but like. One of the things that the optimizer can do is try to estimate, well, here's the distribution of the values coming out of this guy, right? And you need that to know how to, how to size your hash table anyway. And you would say, all right, well, I think my key distribution looks like this, and therefore a bloom filter of this size would be is how I want to, you know, how to size it, avoid that issue where everything's set, set to one. But even with like, you know, a couple of kilobytes, it's, it's, it's still going to produce pretty good results. All right, so this is sometimes called sideway, sideway information passing. Uh, the high-end systems can, can do this kind of stuff. And actually, we'll talk about distributed databases later on in the semester, but like you can imagine now maybe A and B are on different, completely different machines or different data centers. So that rather than me having to go send messages over to the network to go do a probe in the hash join, if I can just send over you know, a couple kilobytes of our, of our bloom filter to the other machine, then I can do a, even more filtering on this side before I start going over the network. Right? This is a huge win for that. But this, this, so this is... And the reason why it's called sideway, sideway information passing is because this is sort of breaking our model for how our queries are going to, our query operators execute, where they have you know these these discrete channels of just sending data up from from the child to the parent and not between siblings, and this sort of violates that. But it's it's a big win, so this is this is a good idea. Okay, so let's finish off talking about when we have hash joins that don't fit in memory. So the if everything fits in memory, then we probably want to use, actually we do just want to use a linear probing hashing table, right? We can approximate the size of the hash table we need for depending what the input data looks like. Uh, and then that fits in memory and that's going to be really fast. The issue though now is if we have to start spilling the disk, now the hash table is going to be terrible for us because now it's going to be random IO because we're going to take every single key and we're going to hash it to some lo slot location in our hash table. And for every single key, that could be another, you know, cache miss and another have to do another page page lookup so what we're going to want to do is we want to convert that random access pattern in our hash table which is the worst thing for us in our database system into something that's more sequential All right the same idea that we applied for this uh, the external merge sort same idea we did for the the hash based aggregation when we spilled a disk so the technique we're going to use is called the grace hash join sometimes it's called the partition hash join i think the textbook refers it to it as the grace hash join but this is a technique that's developed to do hash joins when things don't fit in memory. So the term grace comes from uh, this project. It was an academic project at the University of Tokyo in the 1980s. They built something called a database, the grace database machine. Uh, that project obviously doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but they had a paper that came out at the time as part of this project that talked about how, how to do a hash join when things don't fit in memory. And then for whatever reason, that term stuck. I mean, everyone refers to what I'm going to describe here as the grace hash join. Who here has ever heard of the term database machine? Database appliance? Perfect. Okay. So a database machine or database appliance is like specialized hardware that you buy for a database system. So think about, right, you know, right now when you, when you, you want to run Postgres, what do you do? You go spin up an instance on EC2. You go download Postgres. And then you set up and configure it for your instance size. Yes, you can get you know RDS that's already pre-configured, but in, in general, most people are running you know deploying uh, 
these databases themselves on their own hardware. So the idea of a database appliance is that you can buy hardware from a vendor that's already been set up and tuned for a database system. So you don't have to worry about how to set anything up yourself. So all the high-end companies will sell you very expensive, very, very nice uh, uh, enterprise servers that are tuned specifically for, for a particular database system. So IBM has this thing called Netiza, which they, they sort of killed off, but they, they can sell you a, a rack machine that had Netiza already set up for you. Clusterx was a startup that came out of AOL, and then they got bought by Percona last year or this year. And they used to sell a version of MySQL that would run on our specialized hardware. The most famous one, and probably the most expensive one, is Oracle's Exadata. And this is everywhere. This is like you buy these huge rack machines that have you know, the Oracle data warehouse running it inside it for you. Um, like, like, like we're talking like millions and millions of dollars. And there's some places that spend $100 million a year on running Exadata. It's, it's very expensive. And so a database machine is, think of like an like appliance that, you know, that's tuned specifically for a database system, but then they add in special hardware like custom ASICs that are just for running your database system. So the Grace database machine that they built in the 1980s, it had special hardware to do hash joins very efficiently. So and this, this is sort of how people built databases in the 1980s, and then that all sort of went out of vogue. Everybody wants to run on commodity hardware now because by the time it took for you to come up with your custom hardware for your database system, and then actually you know, fab it and actually produce it and manufacture it, Intel or whoever came out with new chips that also, you know, that already ran faster than what you started with and you lost all benefits. Right? So most database systems run on custom hardware other than like this super high-end stuff from Oracle. Um, there are some newer startups that have come out in the last year. So this is, this is a slide from Yellowbrick. This is a newer da uh, database appliance vendor that sells specialized uh, uh, flash controllers running on, you know, running their particular database system. But most people don't, don't run this kind of stuff unless you have a, have a lot of money. Okay, so the, hash, the Grace hash join has two parts. In the build phase, we're going to split up both tables now based on the hash key and write them out to partitions. So the regular hash join, we only sort of hashed one side and build a hash table for that, and then we probed on the other side. Now what we're going to do is just split up into uh, two separate hash tables on both sides, and then do a, a nested loop join for the partitions that match. And I'll show what that looks like in, in the next slide. So, again, on the outer table, we're going to have a hash table for it, and we're going to just hash all our values and, and populate this guy. And so this won't be a linear probe hash table, this will be a bucket chain hash table. Right, because we could have this, we want to have things that uh, hash at the same location all get mapped to the same partition, the same set of pages. We don't want something that hashed here landing down here. Same thing now on the other side, right? Hash all the values, produce a hash table. And now we're just going to number these, these, these levels as our, as our partitions, right? So now in the, in the probe phase, when we do our join, right? After building the hash table, we're just going to take all the, the buckets within one partition and now just do a nested for loop, right? Again, the idea here is that because we've already partitioned them with the hash function in the very beginning, we know all the data we could ever need to examine for a tuple that exists on this side of, of, the, of the, the, the join, and this bucket can only exist in this side, right? Can't exist anywhere down here. So we don't need to, when we, when we, when we scan everything here, we don't need to look at anything else. Right? It's sort of the same idea we did in the sort merge join. Because we sorted thing, things ahead of time, we know what the boundaries are where there could be possible you know, matches for tuples in, in the outer table. So if everything fits in memory, then this is fantastic. Because right? remember, I showed in the very beginning when we talked about nested loop join, if everything fits in memory, th th this is the, the fastest way to do this. Right? There's no magic. You're building hash functions is wasted instructions. All you're doing is doing you know, single instruction or a small number of instructions to do the comparison and this doing fast forward loops through these things. It means the compiler can start unrolling this loop as well. Yes? Yeah, but still collisions can happen and as you said that it should point to a particular uh, row only. So like yeah. yeah, so he says uh, collisions, can, collisions can occur, right? Because two different values that are, could hash to the same thing, well, I can just, if I'm doing brute force search for the, for the bucket, in the bucket, in memory, then who cares if there's collisions? Now, if everything collides to the same thing, then this starts spilling the disk, then we have a problem. 
right? And we can handle that through what's called recursive partitioning. And this is sort of related to the technique I was talking about last time with the hash aggregation, but we didn't go into the details of it. But we can basically recognize that if we start spilling the buckets uh, within a given partition, we start adding more and more buckets and the chain keeps getting longer and longer because we have collisions, then we can just do another round of partitioning and split it up into even more buckets, do even more subpartitions. And then that way, the idea is that when we do that, 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 that nested loop join, everything fits in memory. But then one-to-one -one, uh, mapping would still happen? If... This question is, does one-to-one -one mapping still happen? Yes. Next slide. Okay, let's see how we do this. So again, this, this is on the outer table. We run the hash function, and we get, create a bunch of, bu bunch of buckets at each partition. So say this one, the chain gets super long. We keep spilling out to new, more and more, more buckets. So if we recognize that there's some threshold to say, well, we've gone past uh, some watermark to say we, we spilled to too many pages, too many buckets, we can then just run uh, the, another hash function on this guy and then split up the even more subpages, right? So, sub buckets. So with all the for the first hash function, we have a bunch of guys mapped to partition one, and then that overflows. So then for partition one, we ran another hash function. Again, it's the same hash function, just a different seed value, and then we split out into more and more buckets. Then now on the uh, when the we do the probe on the inner relation. If we hash to anything that has not been split before, so we'd have some metadata to say, well, if you're, if you're going to hash, you're going to partition zero or going to partition n, the first hash function is fine, right? So now I can find exactly what I'm looking for across these pages here. If though, if I hash to partition one, then I would recognize, oh, well, I had to split that on the build side for the outer relation. So let me go ahead and run the second hash function and then I'll find out re where I really need to go. And you can, just, you can keep doing this over and over again until you get things to fit in memory. Because worst case scenario, you know, the, 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 the column you're joining on, the attributes you're joining on, only has one value. It's always going to hash into the same thing. So therefore, recursive partitioning is just wasted time. In that case scenario, you just fall back to the nested loop join because there's no join algorithm that can make that run faster. Simple? And again, so we can apply the same technique for the, the hash-based aggregation we talked about last time, right? If, if our buckets get too full, then we, we just do another round of, of partitioning. So what's the cost of, this, of doing this, this partition hash join? Well, assuming that we have, we have enough buffers to fit uh, everything in memory to do the, the join part uh, across partitions, it's going to be 3 times n plus n. So the 3 comes from, in the first phase when we do the partition, it's one pass through M and N, the pages of the outer and the pages in the inner relation, one pass to read, and then another round of writes. Right, because we're, we're just, for every single page we read on the inner relation, we're writing another page on the outer relation. Then the second pass is now to do the join part, where we're just, again, just doing a, a nested for loop join, a nested loop join on, on the, the, the buckets within the same partition, and that's just one pass through all the pages as well. So, the, again, the partition phase is 2 times n plus n, probe phase is just n plus n, and then we just put the, the numbers to this, All right, now we can do our join in 0 0.45 seconds. So the sort merge join, best case scenario, was uh, 0 0.59, 590 milliseconds, the, now we're down to 450 milliseconds. That's pretty good. All right, and this is why the hash join is always going to be preferable. Right, any questions? Okay, so uh, just to finish up, as I said multiple times throughout today, uh, if, we, if the data system knows something about what the, what the tables, hash tables are going to look like or what the tables are, I'm, 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 I'm reading into are going to look like, then it can try to size the, 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 the hash tables or the buffers accordingly. So if everything fits in memory, a linear probe hash table is, is, is what we want to use. If we're going to have to spill a disk, then we can use the partition approach and use, with a bucket hash table. Um, the, if you don't know the size, then we could fall back and use a dynamic hash table, like the, the, the linear extendable, or, but those approaches are much more heavyweight to do joins than the simple like bucket hash table or the linear probe hash table. So in this case here, because we're, we're going to have to do a lot of probes and a lot of uh, uh, insertions into our hash table, 
you know, it, the simple is, is usually going to be better for us. All right, then just to summarize the different costs of the things we talked about today, right, the stupid nest loop join could take 1.3 hours. If we had everything in, if we, if we use a block nest loop join, then it would take 50 seconds. The index one depends on what the index data structure we're using, so we can't actually give an exact cost for that. But then the sort merge join was 0.59 seconds, and then the hash join was, was 0 0.45. Yes? Uh, what's the situation where you don't know the size of the outer table? So the question is, what scenario would I not know the size of, of the outer table? Yes. Uh, so in this example, all everything I showed today was one query that joins two tables. And we said we were doing a two-way join operator. So the operator took two tables, produced the output, right? To join them, produced the output. What if I have three tables to join? So again, if I'm doing a two-way join operator, I join, you know, say I have tables A, B, and C, I want to join them. I join A and B, and then the output of A and B is now joined with C. So unless I can have super accurate estimations on what the output is going to be on, you know, for the joins out of an A and B, I may not know how to size things up above. Now for us, like, it depends on how you do query execution, the query processing. We'll talk about this on Monday, but I could do a pipeline approach where for every single tuple I output of an operator, I then immediately feed it up to the next operator and do whatever it is I want to do in that one. So now that's the streaming case, sort of like you're, I, I'm incrementally probing, building my hash table, you know, in, in the second join I want to do. Or I could just say, take the, all the output of my join, put it into a bunch of buffers. Now I know the exact size, and then I can size everything. So in some cases you do, in some cases you don't. Furthermore, the, further, the more joins you have, the worse your estimations get. Because the, the, the cost models are always terrible in the query optimizers. Yes? Um, on the index node, could the join, is it supposed to be a lowercase m in the parentheses? Uh, this question is, in the, yeah. And for this one, should this be a lowercase m? Yes. I'll fix that. Thank you. OK. So the main takeaway for you guys going forth into the real world is that hash join is always going to be preferable to everything else. Uh, except if we, if we want things to be sorted as the output ahead of time, or things are already sorted for us, in which case the sort merge join is going to be preferable. But nine times out of 10, uh, if you take like Postgres or any commercial database system, from what I've seen, they've always pick a hash join. And this is what sort of separates the high-end, expensive, or well-written open source database systems from the, you know, the, the off-brand things, because they're going to be able to do both and reason about in the system what's the right, what's the right algorithm I want to use. And again, this is the beauty of the relational model in SQL. The same SQL query could then choose either of these, other, either of these algorithms we talked about today, and I don't have to go back and change anything in my application to make that work. The data systems can do that for me. Yes? His question is, uh, yeah, so the question is, are all these things true that I'm talking about here, is that true if you're doing outer joins or inequality joins or other anti-joins, things like that? For inner versus outer join, uh, actually, outer join, I don't think you can do, um, actually, outer join, I think you can do everything. For, the, uh, for inequality joins or range joins, you have to use sort merge because you, there's no locality to values in the hash table, right? I, I want to find me all the keys that are less than this other key. I have to use a B plus tree. I have to use a, uh, the sort merge join. Uh, for anti-joins, something doesn't equal something, hash joins are usually better. Actually, almost always better. Okay. And actually, another, another actually extension to your question is, is this still true on single node databases or distributed databases? Yes. Well, we'll cover that in the end of the semester, but in general, yes. Because again, instead of reading from disk, I'm reading from the network, and that's even worse. So these, you know, replace the disk IOs for, with network, network IOs, and, and, and it's still the same. Yes? What's the, like, sorting is better for non-uniform data? Right. So if it's not skewed, Right? It should be, actually, it should be uniform data. If it's uniformly dist distributed, sorting is going to be great for that. If it's heavily skewed, then sorting is bad. But you still have the issue where everything's hashing to the same thing. OK. So now Monday, next, next, next week, we will then now just talk about how to compose 
all these different operators we've talked about and actually run them you know, from end to end, actually be able to execute queries. So I've alluded to this multiple times about the processing models of pushing data up to, from one operator to the next. Now we can actually see how that's actually going to be implemented. And then we'll also talk about how the system can be architected to run queries in parallel. Right? I have multiple cores, I have multiple threads. How am I going to design a system to run multiple queries at the same time and also take the same query and split it up and run on multiple threads at the same time? Right? And that'll segue into, or that'll lead into a discussion at the end of the semester when we talk about distributed databases, because that's essentially what you want to do as well. You want to take a single query and break it up across multiple machines and run that in parallel. Okay? All right. Uh, so we're, we're done for today. Enjoy the 88 degree weather outside, or I, I don't know what that is in Celsius. Oh dear, coming through with my shell and crew. Two cent for a case, give me St. Nas poo. In the midst of broken bottles and crushed up can. Met the cows in the jam, oh how dry I with St. Ives in my system, crack another, I'm blessed, let's go get the next one, and get over, the object is to stay sober, lay on the sofa, better yet, down my sofa. Who be the be stressed out, could never be sun, Rick is a jelly, hit the deli for a cold one, naturally blessed, yes, my rap is like a laser beam, the pawns in the bushes, St. Ives, fill the canteen. Crack the bottle of the St. Ives, sip it through those who don't realize, the drinking ain't only to be drunk, you can't drive, keep my people still alive, and if the saint don't know you from a can of paint, paint.